Before I start my sermon, I, uh, I want to ask you all to do something during my sermon that is a little unusual. I want to introduce you to uh, this very old Bible of mine. It's very beat up, but don't be impressed. It's not because I read it a lot. It's because I dropped it in water years ago. I, think I got this Bible when I was 16 years old. It has the date in the front. And uh, it got dropped in water at some point, completely soaked in water. And Bibles don't tend to hold up very well uh, unless they're totally waterproof when they've been dropped in water. So it just started crumbling and falling apart after that. Um, and there's a reason that I'm going to pass this around. What I'd like everybody to do as I'm preaching is just everybody thumb through this Bible a little bit, especially the New Testament. Be careful with it. You'll, you'll see why. It's not because it's super valuable, okay? But you'll see why I, I'm asking you to be, be careful with it. And um, I'm just going to start by handing it over here uh, to JD, and then if y'all can just keep passing it back, everybody just thumb through it. When you get to the back on this row, hand it over to the back on this other side, and then just keep everybody have a look at it till we get all the way up here in the front. And I guess, Terry, I can just grab it from you a little bit later, and I'll make a point uh, about this. So I'll start out handing it here. <clears throat> now, years ago, uh, I read in one of Bob Waldron's books where he was talking about um, he was talking about the importance of studying the Old Testament and there was an instruction that he had in there that I followed there was a suggestion that he had in there that I actually followed in in real life and uh, that's what you're gonna see in that Bible so I'll bring that back up later now, years ago, I, the first place that I started my first uh, full-time work, my first full-time preaching work, was in Monticello, Florida, up north Florida. And there was a man there that I was good friends with. He was, he was very good to my family and me. He was an elderly gentleman. He was a very faithful brother in Christ. But we had, we had a pretty strong disagreement about something. He was the very first person, and, and probably the only person, that has ever just come out and said to me, we don't need to study the Old Testament. We just need to study the New Testament. And I had never heard somebody actually say that. So we would talk, and, and maybe sometimes he would acquiesce a little and say, okay, we, we need to study the Old Testament, but we need to study the New Testament twice as much as we study the Old Testament. He would say things like that. And we always had a friendly discussion, but we had a pretty strong disagreement about that. He's, he's no longer uh, living. He passed away soon after I left that congregation. But I think that there are probably many brethren who would share a similar sentiment to, to the feeling he had, which, which is, you know, do we really need to spend all this time and effort studying the Old Testament? Don't we really need to, to, to just really study the New Testament? So we're going to ask and answer that question, should we study the Old Testament. And I'm just going to come right out of the gate and give you the answer I know you're expecting, which is yes, we should study the Old Testament. In fact, we should stu study the Old Testament a lot. And th the question then would be, well, why? Why do we really need to study the Old Testament a lot? Or, or to ask the question more specifically, if we are no longer under the Old Covenant, then why do we need to spend so much time studying that old covenant that we're no longer under? I think that's a very good question. Brian, in his Lord's Supper talk, talked about Hebrews chapter 8, where the writer of Hebrews quotes from Jeremiah 31, where Jeremiah prophesied of this new covenant that would come. Would, would come. And after uh, the writer of Hebrews quotes from that passage, he says this in Hebrews 8.13. Uh, the writer says, When he said a new covenant quoting back from Jeremiah, He has made the first obsolete, the He there meaning God, has made the first covenant, the first uh, testament, the Old Testament, obsolete. And he goes on to say, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. I think the idea of that is even in the days of Jeremiah, in a sense, the Old Covenant was already growing old and was ready to disappear but it is now obsolete. It's been replaced by the New Covenant. When you think of the word obsolete, what thought comes to your mind? I immediately think of technology and stuff that was popular five minutes ago and is not popular right now at the moment. Uh, for example, do you kids know what that thing is? 
It's called a blackberry. And people don't really use these very much. Some people still do. I'm not trying to insult anybody who might still use it, but, but you know, you actually had a keyboard on this little thing, and it was kind of like uh, an iPhone in some ways, uh, and you could send messages and stuff like that. Uh, or here, here's something that's called the flip phone, okay? Y'all may say, what is that? I've never seen one of those weird things. That's the flip phone. Some people still use these, but for the most part, they're obsolete. It's, they've been replaced with newer, uh, better technology. Um, and so we could go on and talk about more tech. We could talk about VCRs. We could talk about the 8-track recorder. Some of y'all may remember that. The, all that technology has been replaced with better technology, and that's just going to keep happening. So the, the older technology is obsolete. So it's a very strong word. And that is the word that is used in Hebrews 8.13 to talk about that old covenant, the Old Testament, is obsolete. In other words, it's been replaced, and it's no longer really in use. Now, that doesn't mean there is no use that we can gain from it, but it means we're not under that old covenant anymore. It's obsolete in that sense uh, of the word. So again, a very, uh, a very good question. If that old covenant is obsolete then why do we really need to study it? Or why do we really need to give so much attention to studying it? And so what I'm going to try to do, what my job today is, is to attempt to convince you that, yes, we need to study the Old Testament. In fact, we need to study it a lot if, if we are to really be what God wants us to be. I'm going to give you just three reasons. We could look at a lot more, but just three. And the first of these three is the New Testament tells us to study the Old Testament. The New Testament tells us to study the Old Testament, like Romans 15 and verse 4, for whatever things were written before, and he's talking about the Old Testament, he quoted from Psalm 69 in the previous verse, whatever things were written before were written for our learning. If it was written for our learning, we, we need to learn it. It means we need to study it. We need to be taught in it. Well, that's a simple enough point. But there's a much stronger passage I want to show you in Hebrews chapter 5, where the writer of Hebrews talks about a man named Melchizedek. All y'all know who Melchizedek is, probably because we're familiar with, with uh, the point that the writer of Hebrews makes, that we place extra emphasis. We've got to learn, know who that guy is. Well, in Genesis chapter 14, I'll, I'll explain who Melchizedek. In Genesis chapter 14, uh, Lot was captured. Uh, there, was, there was a battle, and Lot was captured, and, and so Abraham takes over 300 of his own men, and he goes, and he rescues Lot, and he also gets spoils of the victory, spoils of war, and he comes back, and when he returns, he is greeted by this man named Melchizedek, who is king of Salem, and is described as, as priest of uh, the God Most High. But he's not of the line of Aaron. He just kind of comes out of the blue. Where is this... You know, how did this guy become a priest? And we're not really told any of that. And so I'm not going to get all into this, but the writer of Hebrews is making a parallel between the priesthood of Melchizedek and the high priesthood of, of Jesus Christ. And he starts explaining this, and then it's almost like he gets a little frustrated. Like, he would love to go deeper, but he knows they're not ready for it. And he rebukes them. And he says this in Hebrews 5.11, concerning him, that is Melchizedek, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. In other words, he's telling this, uh, this group of Christians, now granted they were Jewish Christians, it is the book of Hebrews after all, but they were Christians. He was saying, you should be more familiar with your Old Testament, you should know more about this man Melchizedek, but there's, I'm limited on what I can say, because I know that you're, you're limited in your understanding. You've become dull of hearing. Now, if they were expected to know about this rather obscure character named Melchizedek, then shouldn't we for sure know about characters like Samuel and Samson and Deborah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Esther and Solomon and David and even maybe some of the more obscure characters like Maybe Jehoiakim and some of these other kings that we've been studying. Shouldn't we be familiar, familiar with that? If we are not, then maybe God would say to us, you know, I'd love for you to understand more, but I know you're dull of hearing. I'd love to explain some deeper things to you, but you can't grasp it because you're dull of hearing. That would be a rebuke to us for not understanding the Bible enough, particularly, in this case, the Old Testament. Now look at what the next verse says. For though by this time you ought to be teachers... 
You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So what, what he's saying, he's in the context again talking about the Old Testament. You are not familiar with these elementary principles. Even matters talking about Melchizedek. And uh, so he's saying you're, you're, you're spiritually immature. That'd be like being a full-grown adult who carries around a bottle of milk everywhere you go and you don't eat solid food. You just drink milk all the time. Be, uh, it wouldn't fit, right? And so that's the situation. And so again, that's a rebuke. If we don't know our Bibles, if we don't know our Old Testament, as we should by this point, and I know it's a process. You're not going to become a Christian necessarily right, off the gate, right out of the gate. You automatically know about Melchizedek. You automatically know about all these other stories uh, and characters uh, in the Old Testament. But over time, God expects us to learn. He expects us to study and to accumulate uh, knowledge. And if we don't, he, he sees us as being a lot less mature than we should be by, by this point, right? So I think that's a pretty strong point, why we need to study the Old Testament. The New Testament tells us to. Second point, we benefit from studying the, the Old Testament. Now, I know s s some of you here like antique cars. I know Jared uh, has, has a Mustang, an antique Mustang. I used to have a 67 Mustang that I bought for my sister. Um, you know, Brian wishes he had a Mustang. <laughs> we, I, I don't know if he wishes he had an antique Mustang or not, but, but a, lot, a lot of you guys in here, you enjoy antique cars. Why? Is it because somebody commanded you and said, you know, thou shalt buy an antique car and learn about it and use it? No, it's because you benefit from it in some way. You like shining it up and getting it out maybe on a Saturday and driving it around if for no other reason just for pleasure on the weekends. But you've derived some benefit from that old car. Well, the same thing is true for our studying of the Old Testament. It shouldn't be that we only study the Old Testament because God said in the New Testament, hey, you should be doing this. But it should also be because we realize we derive benefits from studying the Old Testament. So let's kind of focus on some of those benefits here as we unpack this point. Here's a passage you may have heard of before. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now let's pause. All Scripture, and we normally apply that talking about uh, not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament. It does apply, please don't get me wrong, but in the context, it seems to me he is referring to the Old Testament. He in the previous verse talked about the sacred writings that Timothy was brought up on. And so all Scripture... You know, you have to realize the New Testament wasn't finished yet. They didn't have it all collected and to hold in their hand. Of course, they understood the message that was written from prophets and apostles was Scripture when they wrote it. And so uh, maybe he's not just talking about the Old Testament, but he is talking about the Old Testament. And so think about that. The Old Testament, look what he goes on to say, uh, is profitable. The Old Testament, not just the New Testament, is profitable. It is beneficial for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You mean the Old Testament helps to equip me for every good work? Absolutely. When I grew up being taught martial arts, the style of martial arts I was taught as it eventually became known as, was triad martial arts. Now that's not the Chinese triad. That's, that's something totally different. This triad that, that, that I was taught, the reason it was called triad is because my instructor, Johnny Lee Smith, he, he believed that we needed to learn how to fight standing up, how to fight on the ground with jujitsu, and how to fight if we have a weapon in our hands. So that we have our bases covered from those three angles so that we were thoroughly equipped, whatever the situation. Now, what he was really heavy to teach is, listen, if, if all you do is you go in and you learn some karate moves, you know some kicks and some punches and some chops and some moves, but you don't know how to fight on the ground, and you get into a real fight with somebody, and you try to throw your fancy karate kick at their head, and they grab you and they throw you down on the ground, and now where are all your fancy karate kicks and chops and moves? Now you're on the ground. What do you do now? Well, that's what a real fight is like. 
You have to know how to fight on the ground if you want to how, how to know how to fight in, in a real fight, right? If you want to be thoroughly equipped <laughs> as far as self-defense is concerned. Spiritually, if all we are acquainted with and familiar with is the New Testament, and we don't emphasize the study of the, of, of the Old Testament, we are not thoroughly equipped to do battle with Satan. We're not thoroughly equipped. If we want to be thoroughly equipped for every good work, we need to be familiar with the Old Testament. So you see that that is a benefit that it provides. It is profitable in many ways. And, uh, and, and one of those ways is through the examples that we study in the Old Testament. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now these things, he had, he had just talked about a whole bunch of Old Testament stories, which I'll look at in a second. Now these things happen to them as an example. In other words, an example for us. And they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Well, let's open our Bibles up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's have a look at what are some of these, what are some of these things these examples that Paul is thinking about. This is really powerful. Look, look in verse 1 starting. We're going to read uh, starting in verse 1, and we'll go all the way down through verse 12. Verse 1, he says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Okay, pause. We know what that's talking about. It's talking about the crossing of the Red Sea. And verse 3, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all ate the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. So he's talking about when Moses, when God through Moses made water come from the rock. And of course that happened on two different occasions while they were out there in the wilderness. And the whole congregation was sustained that way, and, and God also gave them manna from heaven. And, of course, the, the spiritual fulfillment of that is Jesus is our rock. Jesus is the living water. Jesus is our bread from heaven. All right, but, but look now in verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. What's that talking about? What Bible period is that? That's the wandering in the wilderness. You remember that after the Israelites came out of Egypt, they go down to Mount Sinai, they build the tabernacle, they receive the law uh, uh, of Moses, then they go up to the edge of the promised land, they go up to Kadesh Barnea, and they send in the twelve spies. And ten of the twelve have a very, very fearful report. We can't enter that land. These people are too big. They don't trust in God. And so what does God say? Well, because you did not trust in me, you are going to all die in this wilderness. This whole generation is going to die in the wilderness. It will be your children who get to enter my land. That's the reference here uh, in, in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 11, now these things happened as examples for us. The Old Testament examples were not for the Jews only. These happened as examples for us Christians. And by the way, I want to pause here. This, Bible. Uh, this was a group of Gentile Christians. Now, I want you to think about that. These people had been converted out of paganism. And Paul is going to, in rapid fire succession, he's just going to go through Old Testament story after Old Testament story without citing it, without talking about any details about it, expecting them to understand all of these stories. These are Gentile Christians that were expected by Paul to be familiar with the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. So let, let, let's continue, all right? So I didn't finish verse 6. Now these things happen as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. What's that a reference to? Numbers chapter 11. The people, they didn't want manna. They didn't want this bread from heaven. They wanted meat. So God gave them more meat than they could stand. And He sent a plague to kill many of the people. Verse 7, Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Well, that's Exodus 32. We all know that's the golden calf. Verse 8, Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. That's a reference to Numbers chapter 25. Do you remember the story? The Israelites committed fornication with the Midianite, with the Moabite women. And they were giving themselves over to the worship to Baal. And so God sent a plague that killed 23,000. 
of the Israelites until finally the priest Phineas took a spear and went into the tent where there was a man and a Moabite woman and he, and he stuck it through them and ended that, ended that plague. All right, now look at verse 9. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Brian talked about this pretty recently. This is in uh, Numbers chapter 21. This is when the, the Israelites, toward the end of the 40 years of wandering, they were traveling around Edom uh, to, go, to go south and then come up on the east side of the Dead Sea. And when they were traveling around this treacherous territory, they began to complain. And they began to say to God, why, you know, to Moses, why did you take us out of Egypt to be in this horrible place? And so because of their whining and complaining and lack of faith, God sent serpents to bite them and and many of them died. And of course, the brazen serpent uh, was set up for them uh, by Moses. Verse 10, Nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. That's Numbers chapter 16. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And initially a man named On, who apparently backed out, because we don't hear his name anymore. But you, you had Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and they come before Moses and Aaron. And they say, you are not the only ones who are holy. All of us are holy. In other words, we all deserve to be priests. They were not of the lineage to be priests. So Moses said, we'll see what God has to say about that tomorrow. And so they came back the next day, and God ca caused the ground to open up and swallow up Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and their households. And then it closed back up. The 250 who were in on this conspiracy, God sent fire to consume those 250 men. The next day, the congregation comes before Moses and Aaron. This was all your fault that all those people died. So God sent a fire and consumed many of those. Actually, that's not when he sent a fire. What happened there is God sent a plague. And uh, the way that the, the story is worded sounds like the plague started on one end of the congregation and was just wiping out the Israelites like this. And, and Moses said to Aaron, Quickly, take your censer and go stand between the living and the dead. So he took his censer, which is like a bowl with, with coals in it, and he put incense on it, and it would have like a chain. And he ran, and he stood between the living and the dead. And when the plague reached Aaron, it stopped. And the rest of the people were spared. Those kinds of stories are so powerful. Why are they there? Paul says it. In the next verse, now these things happen to them as an example. Sorry, I'm pointing at the TV back there. Y'all not look, don't look at the TV. Look at this. Now these things happen to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages to come. And what is the ultimate lesson that he draws from this? Well, look at the next verse. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. If we start thinking in our Christian life, I'm doing great. Look at me. I'm learning the Bible. I'm going to church a lot. I'm staying strong out of temptation. My marriage is good. My family's doing great. I'm doing wonderful. We need to be careful. If you think you stand, take heed that you don't fall. And how can we learn to always be careful and always take heed? Well, one way is by reminding ourselves with these examples from the Old Testament of what God does when people turn away from Him. And I understand, trust me, understand, it's repetitive. A lot of these stories are the same. It's like, okay, they disobey, they get destroyed. They disobey, they get destroyed. They disobey, they get destroyed in a slightly different way, but they still get destroyed. They disobey in a slightly different way, but they still get destroyed. And it's the lesson over and over, hundreds of times maybe in the Old Testament. And, and I understand the thinking. Well, why do we need to keep studying these same kinds of stories that make the same kind of point? Because... Let him who thinks he stand take heed that he does not fall. God knew that we need those reminders and those lessons from many different angles and many nuanced ways over and over and over and over and over and over and over. That's why he recorded all those events for us in the Old Testament. And we need them or he wouldn't have given them to us. We need them or he wouldn't have given them to us. So all these examples, and it's not just the negative examples and the negative stuff that we learn from the Old Testament that we need to kind of avoid. But there are also many positive things that we learn in the Old Testament as well. Going back to this Romans 15 verse from earlier, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning. Why, Paul? That we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. 
and you go and you read passages that talk about God's character, His loving kindness from generation to generation, that gives us hope. You go back in the Old Testament, you read about these prophecies about the Gentiles being saved in the New Covenant, and we go, hey, I'm in that New Covenant. That should give us hope. You read about prophecies about the Messiah and the nature of His life and the, and the nature of His death even. Prophesied hundreds of years in advance. That gives us hope. The Old Testament Scriptures, whatever things were written before, are things that can give us In the two verses prior to that famous all Scripture is given by inspiration of God passage, listen to what Paul told Timothy. You, however, Paul said, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings. Well, what sacred writings was he brought up on? It wasn't the New Testament. It was the Hebrew Bible. His mother was Jewish. His father was a Greek, but his mother and his grandmother, we know from another place in Timothy, uh, taught the Scriptures to young Timothy. So he was brought up learning the sacred writings, Paul says, which are able, now pay attention to this, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation, which is through faith in Christ Jesus. What? The Old Testament gives me wisdom that leads to salvation? Through faith in Christ Jesus? How is that? I mean, this reminds me of Galatians 3.24. I have the wrong verse on your outline. It says Galatians 3.22, uh, but it's Galatians 3.24. Uh, Therefore the law has become, the law of the Old Testament has become our tutor, that it might lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. I talked about last week in my Lord's Supper talk that in Galatians chapter 3, uh, it says that God preached the gospel to Abraham. 430 years before the law of Moses was ever established, saying, In you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That is a summation of the gospel. The rest of the Bible tells us how that promise in Genesis 12, verse 3, was unfolded in Jesus Christ. It is in Habakkuk, in Habakkuk, that God says the just shall live by faith. We're learning the gospel in the Old Testament. And without understanding the animal sacrifice system of the Old Testament, you can't possibly understand Jesus as the Lamb of God and the sacrifice Jesus offered. If the Bible were a house, if the Bible were a house, what would the Old Testament without the New Testament be? The Old Testament without the New Testament is like a house without a roof. Any of y'all want a house that doesn't have a roof? It's not going to be fun here in Florida for very long. What would the New Testament without the Old Testament be? The New Testament without the Old Testament is like a house without a foundation. Now, which do you want? You want a house without a roof or you want a house without a foundation? You don't want either one. We need the whole house. We need to study the New Testament. We need to study. In fact, if, if you favor the New Testament, please don't think I'm saying there's anything wrong with you. If sometimes you, in, in our adult Bible class, you think, I need a little break from the study of the Old Testament. I need to get in here and, and, and I need to study a little Philippians or whatever class they're doing in the alternative class, assuming that we continue that. Please, I, don't think that I'm rebuking you for that. I, I, I understand that. Although I really do enjoy my, myself a good study of the Old Testament, a thorough study of, of the Old Testament. But... We need the New Testament, but we also need the Old Testament. In fact, the Old Testament is not just in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is also in the New Testament. And that's why I passed around the Bible. So, did we get back around to the front yet with it? We're still looking at it? Do we know where it is? All right, Terry's got it. Okay. You want to toss it up here? I'll, no, I'm just kidding. Um, just keep, you know what, keep passing it around. And I want to talk about that Bible, if, if you all have time to kind of go through it a little quicker so that everybody has a chance. Uh, I referred to that 
thing that I read in one of Bob Waldron's books uh, years ago. He, he wrote, what if, what if we were to take our New Testaments and take a pair of scissors and cut out every single quotation of the Old Testament? A tattered mess. So I figured I had this Bible that I had, as I mentioned earlier, I dropped in the water. It was pretty much ruined. And so I felt, I didn't feel guilty about taking a pair of scissors to this particular Bible. And so um, I, I went through the New Testament, every single page, and I found every single quotation of the Old Testament. And with a pair of scissors, I cut out every single quotation of the Old Testament. Now, I did not cut out the allusions to the Old Testament, because if I did that, there'd be no way to hold the pages together. There'd be nothing left. Like the book of Revelation, not a single quotation of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. But probably more allusions to the Old Testament than any other, any other New Testament book. It's chock full of allusions from beginning to end of the Old Testament. So uh, just the quotations. And, you know, if you don't get a chance to look at it, that's okay. I'll just show you what through it a little bit. This is Matthew. It's the book of Matthew. Look how many chunks are missing. Here's Mark. A lot of, a lot of chunks of, of Mark missing. A lot of quotations of the Old Testament that are there. This is Luke. This is Acts. So again, a lot that was missing. What about when we get into books like Romans and Galatians? There's a lot missing. This is Romans. I mean, it's just pitiful what's left if you cut out all the quotations of the Old Testament. What about Hebrews? <laughs> this is Hebrews. <laughs> That's why I told you to be careful with that Bible, uh, because these pages are just going to rip if you turn them a little too fast, uh, which is probably okay anyway. But, um, but I might want to use the Bible in a future illustration, so I do kind of want it to hold together. But uh, what I did, I preached this sermon, not this sermon, but it was a similar sermon um, in Monticello years ago. And I took all of those scriptures that I had cut out of that Bible, and I put them in a Ziploc. I took it down to the, the table, because they had a table like this too, most churches do, and I, I opened it up and I just dumped them out at the end of my sermon. I said, this is, these are all the scriptures that, that are from the Old Testament, they're quoted in the New Testament. And, and uh, it's, it's a great big pile. It's a great big pile. And again, it's just to make the point if we don't understand the Old Testament, how are we possibly going to understand the New Testament? How are we going to even begin to understand? Look how much is of the Old Testament is in the New Testament. And those are just the direct quotes. Those aren't the illusions. It's a simple point. But I hope that it makes the point. And I, I say this partially just to encourage us, because we're deep in a pretty long study of the Old Testament here at Palm Springs Drive. It can feel like a lot sometimes. It's worth it. It's God's will that we study not just the New Testament, but that we study every book of the Old Testament and not leave any of it out. Now, three quick kind of takeaways. Number one, I want to encourage us all to keep the right attitude about studying the Old Testament. Sometimes we might can sort of roll our eyes, you know, at least in our mind. Oh, here we go again. More kings, more genealogies, you know, more of the same stories over and over. It's like never ending. Please check yourself in your heart that you don't let yourself get the wrong attitude about that. Secondly, Please try not to ignore the Old Testament in your personal Bible reading. I, I certainly think we need the New Testament. But don't leave the Old Testament out. And you probably have to write kind of quick because I'm going quick. Thirdly, apply yourself to know the Old Testament well. Brian and I, we go to a lot of trouble to try to make the Old Testament stories and books Sticky. We want you to remember this stuff. So we try to re we drill the prophets, we drill the kings, we try to encourage you to memorize lists, you know, like uh, memorize the Ten Commandments, memorize the twelve tribes of Israel, memorize the judges, you know, m memorize the list of kings, even. 
And I think it's important to analyze the knowledge of the Old Testament so it's not just in the book, but it's in our brain, it's in our head, it's in our mind. And uh, so that we know about even characters like Melchizedek. And in doing that, it's not just the uh, kind of accumulating of facts, but it is growing so that we will know God better and serve Him better. And so in saying all of this, We've been really emphasizing knowledge and study this morning. I don't want to leave you with the impression that that's all that matters in service to God. The spiritual growth cycle is first to worship God. Second, to study His Word. Third, to love one another. And that includes loving your neighbors, loving your enemies even. And fourth, to reach the lost. To make an effort to try to save those around you. Who, who are in a, in a lost condition, spiritually. And if we do these studying the Old Testament, the, the end result and the motive is not just so that we may not get punished by God, but the motive is that we might grow to His glory. The motive is that we might have a real relationship with our God. How can we have a relationship with somebody we don't even know? How do we get to know Him? Largely, it is through studying His Word. So I hope these thoughts are encouraging to you this morning. If you're not a Christian, if you don't have a relationship with God, and you don't have the salvation which is found in Christ Jesus, the Scripture will lead you to the wisdom that leads to the salvation, which is through faith in Christ Jesus. And what Scripture teaches for you to do, if you're not a Christian, is come putting all your trust in Him, believing in Him, repenting of your sins, confessing His name, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, and continuing to follow His commandments, complete life to Him. If you do that, you will be saved by His grace, by His mercy. If we can assist you in that, or if you need our prayers, we invite you to come now as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Here we go, 341.